Word of the Lord this morning, and we continue with, uh, we're coming to a close uh, of, our, uh, of our series, How We Grow Through Prayer. We'll continue this morning with prayer. We'll finish up uh, the section about prayer uh, next week. We won't, won't, <clears throat> won't be finished this week, but we turn again to it this morning um, as we talk about how we grow. I was reminded, uh, I was listening to the Word this morning, as I often do on Sunday mornings. Um, I had been, after yesterday, I had looked at news quite a bit because of what happened in Paris, since that was really on my mind even as I was preparing. And this morning early, as I was getting ready, I thought, Lord, I need to get that out of my, out of my mind. I, I need a different focus. And so, as I often do on Sunday mornings, I, um, I've got the... Uh, the uh, audio Bible on my phone, so I was listening to it on my phone, and I was listening, I thought, oh, listen to Ephesians, so I was listening to Ephesians as I was getting ready, and, and uh, got to chapter 4, which is a great chapter, all the chapters in Ephesians are great, but I was reminded as I was thinking through and preparing, um, kind of going through uh, in my thoughts for this morning, in Ephesians 4, one of the things that Paul is inspired to write by God, God the Holy Spirit is that God gives uh, gifts to the church for the help of the church. So it's apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and, and so on. He gives those to the church. But it's very clear in chapter 4, and I urge you, not right now, but um, later this week, go back and read chapter 4 for yourself of Ephesians 4, and you'll be reminded, you will see that what it says, these, these gifts are given to the church. By the way, there's Sister Lisa over there in the corner. I looked back there to say, hi, Sister Lisa. Sister Lisa's back from Germany in her travels around the world. Hey, Miss Lisa. <laughs> Way back over there in that corner. She's gone too long this time, I think. So, um, But uh, I, I was reminded of that. So God gives these offices to the church, and then and he calls people to fill these offices. He puts his calling in their hearts, and then they respond. We respond to the Lord. And the purpose, go back and read in Ephesians 4, the purpose of those gifts, those offices to the church, are not for any one person to say, oh, I'm the pastor, I'm an evangelist, or as we sometimes hear, I'm an apostle, you know? And the, especially those with apostles, they... they at least it seems that way. But Ephesians 4 is so very clear, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul says it's for the sake of the church. It's for the building up of the church. It's to help the church grow into maturity. That, that is the, in various ways, in the various ways, it is the responsibility of those who are called of pastors, teachers in the church, also to protect the church, and that's in other places. But it is our responsibility to help you grow up into the person that God has for you to be, to grow up, and then in growing up, as you mature, you become productive in God's family and in God's kingdom. The 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 baby, the baby Christian, the immature Christian, the, the childish Christian that has not yet grown up. God loves that Christian. God loves that his, because it's, it, that person is his child. But there's very little fruitfulness and there's very little productivity from a child or from an immature Christian. And it is God's desire to grow you up so that as you grow up, then you will also be productive in the family of God. And you read chapter 4, it talks about we grow up and then there's love, there's unity, there's harmony, and there's productivity as we grow. <coughs> and that is, and so you see it in different ways, but that, that's my responsibility. That's Pastor Renee's responsibility. Not that we go out and do the work, although we have the privilege of being involved in ministry. The primary work of the church, the ministry of the church, brothers and sisters, it's supposed to come through you. It's not, it's not, oh, Pastor Renee and I, we do it all and we go, and, and we go out and we whatever. We are to help you grow up into what God has for you to be so that you will do the work that God has called you to do. And you'll be partnered with God in ministry and you will one day receive a reward for faithfulness and for faithful work and ministry before God. And one day, if I've done my work, 
and you've done your part, one day I will stand before God, you will stand before God, and do you know what you are going, you personally, are going to hear Him say to you, well done good and faithful servant. Don't you want to hear that? I surely do. I surely do. I want to hear. I want to hear Jesus say that to me, to call my name. And I've been faithful and I've done it. And so that's one of the reasons I've been teaching on how we grow. It's my responsibility. It's my responsibility to, to share this truth with you under the power and, and the inspiration, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and it's your responsibility to respond not to me, not to me, but to the Word of God and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So he, he, he reminded me of that this morning. You say, all of that in the time it took you to get ready? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, I thought, I've been thinking about it, though, and I've, I've been thinking on it. But you go back and read Ephesians 4. It's really all about grow up, grow, grow up in God. And so this is what we're looking at. So we've looked at, here's about a six sentence review. First thing we looked at, what is one of the, what is one primary way God helps us grow? What does He provide for us? And we're responsible in many ways to take it in. The Word of God. The Word of God. Nothing takes its place. Brothers and sisters, human experiences, as good as they are, and I love experiences, and I love biographies and autobiographies. Those are great, and they encourage us, but they cannot take the place of the preaching of the Word of God or the reading of the Word of God. We need the Word of God in our lives, and we need, and, and we need, I need it, teaching as I study the Word, but also as I listen. I listen to preachers and teachers as well, and I'm encouraged, and I read, I read articles and I read books from great men and women of God, and I'm encouraged and I'm challenged as well. So one of the primary means is through the Word of God. If you do not have a place for the Word of God in your life, you will not grow. Listen carefully. You will not grow. You must have place in your life. You must make place. I shouldn't say have place. That's too passive. We must make place for the Word of God in our lives and we will grow. The Word of God, it gives us some meat. It gives us some foundation. It's, a, it's, it's something that, that's solid. It's the Word of God stands forever. So that has to take <coughs> come into our lives. Then the second thing we talked about, what is the, the, the uh, I can't think of the right word, situation's not the right word, the, the climate. Climate's not the right word either. Environment. Environment, that's the word. There you go, thank you. I have to go back to noun school. I've been outside. <laughs> the environment for growth. An environment for growth is in fellowship. It's in, the fel in fellowship. And the Bible makes that very, very clear. So, Fellowship with the family of God must be part of your life if you want to grow in, grow in God. It must be. You say, oh, well, Pastor Jennifer, you just say that because you're pastor and you want us to come and sit and listen when you preach. Well, I do want you to come, but that it is not because of I want you to come and listen. It's because this is what the Word of God says. We must be part of fellowship. Oh, that's a good reminder. Now, look how nicely I'm going to handle that. Please don't forget to check your phones and put them on silent. How's that? And so there must be fellowship. Now let me say something. In Hebrews 10, the writer to Hebrews says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, and all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, times are getting harder. Uh, so get together. Don't give up meeting together, and even more, because times are getting tougher. That's a, a loose translation. How much more we need that now? But I want to say something. That is a small part of fellowship, coming on, coming, gathering together with brothers and sisters. That's only a small part of fellowship, because you know as well as I do, at times there is a person can come in these doors and sit here and walk right out after the church, after service is over, and there may be very little fellowship that takes place. They've just come and shh, they're gone again, but there has not been any opening of that person's life to other Christians. There's not been any sharing. Now that can't really take place while you just sit here and while I'm preaching but certainly as we pray together in small groups that we have and beyond that in the in the literal fellowship times the times that we think of as fellowship in other words those times when you get together with other Christians and you eat together 
and you share together over the table and you go out together, you play together, you laugh together, you talk together. That's part of fellowship. That's part of fellowship. And the Bible is very clear. It is in that environment. It is in that climate where you will really thrive, where you will really grow. And if you are not letting that be part of your life, your growth will be stunted. You'll grow some, but you won't grow a lot. And you say, well, Pastor Jennifer, that's harsh. That's not what I've said. It's what the Word of God shows us time and time again. I think that's why when we read the book of Acts, we read so much about the early church. It talks about they prayed together. It talks about all of these things. But one of the things we read so much about the early church is that they fellowship together. They had meals together. You know, if I am... If I'm sitting with you over a table and we're sharing food together, maybe that I've cooked for you or that you've cooked for me, it's hard for us to be enemies, isn't it? When we're seated, when we're up close and personal, and even more so, you know, in, in, the, in those times there would be a common shared dish and they would use hands to eat. That was, that was the most common. They'd, they'd dip into the, same, into the same pot together. It's pretty hard. To, get, to stay angry and upset and hurt with a brother or a sister when that's the type of closeness that you have day after day after day. And so that is to be part of our lives and it is in that environment that we grow. Okay, so the first one, Word of God. Second, fellowship. And then we started talking last week. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still getting over a cough that I've had for a long time. Um, and... Uh, we started talking last week more about prayer and how prayer helps us grow. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more this morning. Brothers and sisters, in a gathering this size, I can tell you right now, among this, in this group, there are some who are really prayer warriors, who are called, who have a, a true heart for prayer, who love to pray, who more than anything else, I want to pray, I want to pray. And I'll be really honest with you. I so admire, I so respect people like that. And I do believe that there's a gifting, a calling, and a strengthening, and a gifting for certain ones in that area. But, but, if we leave prayer to those few that are really like that, the church will suffer and we will suffer because the encouragements to prayer that we read in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, these are encouragements for each one of us, each one of us. Some of you this morning are really baby Christians. You're just starting in the Lord. Everything that we read in the Word of God about prayer, it's for you. It's for you and it's for me as well. And so we can't just leave it for a few like, oh, that person will really pray. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to call that person and have them to pray. What we're talking about this morning touches each one of us. It touches each one of us. And if we don't, if prayer is not part of our lives, we will grow very little, very little very little. So we want to, to talk about this this morning <coughs> and we'll finish it up, I trust, next week. And I want to talk for just a little bit about hindrances to growth as we talk about prayer. And a, as we look at that, there are many, many more than this, but I just want to sort of let it come up on your radar, if you will, because if these are environments, if these are ways God has provided in His church to help us grow, surely the enemy will oppose and hinder in each one of these areas, won't he? Surely he will. The enemy knows if he can keep you and me from growing, if he can keep us baby Christians and immature, he has little to fear from us. His kingdom is secure against attacks from us if we are immature baby Christians that are not growing in Him. And so the enemy, if he can keep us from coming to God, he will certainly do that. And the Bible makes that very clear. But beyond that, once we come to Him and salvation comes into our hearts and lives and we're called out of darkness and we're brought into the kingdom of God, then the enemy will continue to oppose, let me keep them babies, let me keep them ignorant, let me keep them immature, if I can. Let me keep them 
disagreeing with each other and questioning God and, and concerned only with me and mine and whatever without seeing the bigger things that God has. And I believe the enemy works to hinder. So let's look very quickly at some of those ways. How does he hinder us in the Word? We have one of the best examples if we go all the way back where? To the book of Genesis. That's right. Pastor Renee knew that anyhow, but he was in the first service too, but he knew that because he's because he's a <laughs> he's a good pastor. Remember in the very beginning, God loves Adam and Eve. He's telling them all of these things, and we know this very well. He's speaking with them, and then the devil inhabits the serpent. And in the guise of the serpent, not an ugly old snake slithering on the ground, but the Bible says at that time, the serpent was the most beautiful of all of God's creations, which tells you something. Let me make a separate application. Look what sin will do to you and to God's creation. If, if you were to look now, what is the most feared and reviled of all, of all creatures? The serpent, the snake, a snake is. And, and truly, I think that's, that's where we see in a very practical way the results of, of disobedience to God and, and, and sin. You, you see it in that way. That's another thing. Don't get off on that. Let's keep going in, in this direction. So the serpent comes. What is the first thing he does? So these are hindrances to growth in the Word. What does he do? Does the serpent say, God's a liar! Does he start off by saying that? No. What does he do? Did God really say... And he comes and he causes us to question. Does God, re does God really say that? Is, is that? is that, and then he takes a little bit further? Is that really what he means? Does he really mean? No, he doesn't really mean you're going to die. And so it doesn't look like the enemy and it doesn't sound like the enemy. Sometimes it's our own thoughts. Did God really say that? But the enemy is at work to hinder us in the area of the word so that we will not grow up in him. And then he goes further. And if we give him a place, and we give him an opening, and we give him an ear, what happens next? He leads us along the path to question the heart of God and the love of God. You know what, what, what does the serpent say next? He says, God knows if you eat it that you'll be like him. Mm. Now, let me ask you something. You say, well, the serpent has never said that to me. Oh, yes, he has. Yes, he has. How has it come out? How has he said it? Another reminder, turn off your phones. Okay, how, has, how does the serpent do that? Let me ask you this. You get in a tough situation. You get in a tight situation. Wait, that's okay. Keep here. Difficult situation. And you're in that situation. And what do you think and what do you feel? I'm sorry, what do we think, what do we feel, and what do we sometimes say? Why is God letting this happen to me? God, if you loved me, if you, ah, that you know why you're laughing? Because you've done it. You've said it. God, if you really loved me, if you really loved me, you wouldn't let this happen. God, why did you, why did you let this happen? Let me tell you what happens then when, when we start going down that path, then we get cut off from the only one who can really help us, right? He's the one that can make a difference in our lives, but we're already questioning His purposes in our lives. We're already thinking, well, why is, does God really love me? Why is He letting this happen? He's not fair to me. He loves them better than He loves me, because look, it hasn't happened to them, but it's happened to me. And He cuts us off. He cuts us off as He uses the Word of God, then He takes us further down that path. How else does the enemy, and then that gets into fellowship, and then we start breaking fellowship, don't we? And then we're cut off even more from the source, the vital source, and we definitely don't grow. How else does the enemy use the word to hinder our growth? One of the things I have found, especially among sincere believers, sincere Christians, is this. We fall short, we fail in an area, we're weak in an area, and the enemy comes to us, and it may not sound like the enemy, but it is the enemy, and he says, the Word of God says this, you've blown it. You failed. Loser. Weak Christian. How will God ever use you? Look what you did. Because the Word says, be holy for I am holy. And what I have found is this, the enemy tries to hinder us by using the Word of God 
against us by twisting it and using it against us. Let me say something to you this morning. Very, very clear. Do you want to know if it's the enemy attacking you or the Holy Spirit's work? If it is the enemy, you will feel condemned and you will want to withdraw from the church and from God and you will want to isolate yourself. That's how the enemy works. If it is God, the Holy Spirit at work, He will bring you to the Word of God and He will lead you to the Word of God and He will work through the Word to restore you not to push you away and not to isolate you. A good example of that is in Psalm 51 after David had sinned so terribly. Murderer, liar, adulterer. And, he, and then he comes and you see him pouring out his heart to the Lord as he comes back to, the God, comes back to God. The Holy Spirit will always work in your life to restore you. No matter what the sin no matter how far you've fallen, no matter how terrible, God does not condemn. You're condemned already because of sin. So there's no need for God to do any condemning. God works to restore. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. He says, I came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved, that there might be hope. So if there's condemnation at work in your life, it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. It's never Jesus when there's condemnation. But the Holy Spirit works to restore. Let Him work. Close your ears to the eyes, up, to the lies and the words of the enemy when you feel that going on in your life. Don't let Him cut you off. So we see that in the Word. What about in fellowship? What do we see in fellowship? And there's much more here. I, I really am trying to go quickly. How does the enemy try to hinder us in, in fellowship? I think one of the ways the enemy hinders us in fellowship is to make us feel independent and self-sufficient. Really. He, he works to make us feel independent and self-sufficient. I'm so convicted when I read Paul, Paul's writings to the, to the churches. Here's the great and mighty Paul. Honestly, the great and mighty Paul. And he says, I'm praying for you. I thank God when I pray for you. Then you know what he says in Ephesians and in other places? Not just in Ephesians, in several other places. Do you know what Paul says? Paul says, pray for me too. Pray for me too. If Paul felt and saw his need of connection with other believers, though he had founded those churches, many of them. Though he had led many of them to the Lord, he still comes to them, he's humble before them, and he says, pray for me, pray for me. And when we feel, I can make it on my own, when we feel independent and self-sufficient, that's when we're in trouble, brothers and sisters. That's when we're in danger. And the enemy will work to do that. How else does the enemy work <clears throat> to hinder us in fellowship? I see it in Hong Kong all the time. I really do. I see it so strongly. The enemy, I believe, heightens and strengthens the pressures, the legitimate burden works that we have to do. And I've, I've never seen a place like Hong Kong where there is such a work pressure, where there's such a constant demand um, in work, in families as well. Those of you that are families that have that children, you know the pressures of school. You want their kids this, their kids that, their kids. I remember when I was growing up, a gazillion years ago, <laughs> nobody would schedule anything on Sunday. Not nothing was. Some of you are saying what? That's because you're much younger than I am. Truly. A school, there would, they wouldn't dream of scheduling anything on Sunday. Sunday was the Lord's Day. You don't have activities on Sunday. Now, Sunday really is the chosen day, isn't it? Sunday is the chosen day for, ske for scheduling extra activities. And, and parents, I know it's hard. I don't have all the answers. I don't have children. But I do want to say to you from the Word of God, from the Word of God, don't let the pressures of this world Cut you and cut your family off from fellowship. Because when that happens, when that happens, the enemy wins a victory in our lives and in our families' lives. Pray. Ask God to help you. And I'm not, I'm not preaching this from a, you know, 
don't come to me afterwards and say, yeah, but you don't have any kids. I don't have any kids. That's true. All I can do is say this is what the Word of God shows us. And what I can say is pray and ask God for wisdom, how to make good choices, how to keep right priorities, and, and meet these demands in our lives. Because the enemy will work to, the enemy will work to fill your life with legitimate demands that take place on Sunday, legitimate things that take place on Sunday and other times, and other times when there, when there would be fellowship. And so just be aware of that. It's not God. It's not God. The enemy works in that, in that area. How else does the enemy work to, to hinder our fellowship? Here's one of the big ways, I think, and I just, I'll just say it briefly and then we keep on going, and then we'll talk about how the enemy hinders us in prayer. Here's what I think the enemy uses more than anything else to hinder us in fellowship. I believe the enemy works overtime to cause us to take offense easily and to hold on to grudges and hurts. And that damages friendships and that damages fellowship in the church. So I want to ask you, I want to ask you something this morning. And it's not, you don't have to answer me. You, you talk to God about it. Are you holding something in your heart right now against a brother or a sister in church? Are you? It's been in your mind. You've been thinking about it. You're not happy with them. You don't, you don't want to forgive them. They said something and you didn't like it. And you're hurt. You're upset. You're angry. You're whatever. And it's filling a place in your heart. It's filling a place in your heart. And don't start looking away. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. We all struggle with that. Pastors struggle with that. You think pastors don't hear bad things sometimes? Ouch! We probably hear worse things than you do at times. No joke. No joke. And it is no joke, but what I want to say is this. Brothers and sisters, do you really want to give part of the precious space in your heart to the work of the enemy? Really, it's that simple. Do you really want to do that? I don't. For years in my life, I was a sensitive Christian. I really was. I was a sensitive Christian. I got upset easily. I took offense easily. I held on to, well, they hurt me and they this and that until the time came some years ago. I thought, God, I am so sick of this. I don't want this in my life. I don't want this in my heart. I want my heart reserved for you and for your work. Lord, take it out. Get rid of it. And sometimes it took time because sometimes it gets roots, right? It gets roots. What I want to say to you is this. Think about it if you're holding on to it because you're making a choice to give that space to the enemy. You're, you're making a choice. Is that really the choice you want to make? Is that really your decision? Surely not. Surely not. Save your heart for the good things of God. Save your heart for the good things of God. Amen. Amen. Now don't come out afterwards and say, Pastor Jennifer, who told you? Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit told me. Holy Spirit told me. You, so if you're upset, you go talk to him about it. <laughs> I'm not joking. I, remember I told you a few uh, years ago, somebody came to me. I was preaching one Sunday morning. Somebody in the church came to me. They were so upset. They, they said, Pastor Jennifer, who told you about fill in the blank? Really? And I looked at the person and I said, nobody. And they said, yes, they did. They came and they told you about that disagreement we have. I said, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. And it was just as if the Holy Spirit had, had just had plunged an arrow in the heart. I hope they got it right. I don't know. Listen, you know why? It's not because your pastors are so wise and so whatever. It's, that's not why. It's because God loves you. God loves you. God loves me. And he wants us to grow up in him. And so he's, he brings his word to us that we might grow and take care of things that need to be taken care of. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now it makes sense that he, he would hinder us in the word and he would hinder us in fellowship, that he would hinder us in prayer. Right? Yes. Makes sense. That's kind of a no-brainer. And we have two examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I can take off my watch now so I can... <laughs> If I look up there, then it's too obvious. If I have it here, then it's not, it's not quite as obvious. But I want us to just look briefly, and we're not even going to look at the scriptures, but I want to mention two examples, one Old Testament, one New Testament, that you know 
that helps us see in a practical way, not in the teaching of it, but in a practical way about how the enemy tries to hinder us in prayer. This is not an in-depth teaching. It is just a, something for us to understand. And the first one is in the Old Testament, and it's really mysterious. It really is. It's one of the passages we read. It's in the book of Daniel. Okay, it's in the book of Daniel, and it really is mysterious. And you know what? It's the only time we see something like this in the Bible, but God gives, God the Holy Spirit inspired, there's a big space given to it in that book. And it's quite mysterious, and I don't understand everything about it, but I'll tell you this. Sometimes people read that, they develop books and books and books and books about one passage or whatever, and frankly, I don't think we should. I think we just need to understand some basic things about it. But it's in the book of Daniel. We know who Daniel was, don't we? We know that Daniel was a faithful man. He lived all of his life as a prisoner of war in Babylon. So if we think we have it tough, Daniel had it tough in, a in an ungodly country. But he grew. God gave him favor because of his conviction and because of his stand. And God used him in many ways. God used Daniel for you and for me. Because later in his life we read that God gave visions and dreams to Daniel about Israel and about the world events that are coming. World events, brothers and sisters, that are falling into place right now. Right now. And God gave the visions and the dreams and the understanding and the interpretation to Daniel. So we see that in the earlier chapters and then we come to chapter 10 of Daniel. In the earlier chapters, God would give a vision or a dream, and then he sent the angel, the messenger of God. What is an angel? Simply a messenger of God. That's the simplest way to understand it. He sent Gabriel. You say, oh, Gabriel's a messenger. Yes. Which angel is used in the New Testament to bring God's very important message of the arrival of Jesus to Mary? Gabriel. It's Gabriel. So in the Old Testament, God gives visions and dreams to Daniel, and then he sends. Daniel doesn't command angels to do anything. God is the one that sends Gabriel to give the answer so that Daniel can understand. Then, chapter 10, the very last vision that Daniel's ever given, and it's a big one about a great war, and it's a tough one, and it causes Daniel, oh, what, what is this? What is this? And he starts praying, and what happens? Nothing. And he prays more, and what happens? Nothing. He's had this vision and dream. He knows it's from God, but he doesn't understand it. He knows it's important, but he doesn't know why it's important. He knows it is meaningful, but he doesn't know the meaning. And so he starts praying. How long does he pray? He prays for three weeks. He fasts and he prays and he waits on God for three weeks. And to me it's interesting as we look at this because it's a little bit like this. Here's this mysterious realm of prayer. And frankly, brothers and sisters, prayer is kind of mysterious. It really is. There's so much we don't, that God doesn't tell us about prayer, but he says pray. And so we pray. But in this instance, it's as if here we are, we're praying, and it's as if God takes the curtain and he pulls the curtain back so that we can see what's really going on as he's praying. That's really what happens in chapter 10. And what happens? As he's praying, it's three weeks of fasting and praying, waiting for God, waiting for the answer. Then an angel appears. And the angel says, don't be afraid, Daniel, when you first I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You read it for yourself. Daniel chapter 10. When you first began to pray, God, your words were heard and God sent the answer. Now hang on to that. When you first began to pray, your words were heard and the answer came. But it took three, three weeks for the answer to come. Why? Because just as God sent an answer for Daniel's prayers in response to prayer, the enemy, who is also an expert in this realm, the enemy's an expert in this realm, in this spiritual realm. He is. He is. The enemy saw and the enemy opposed. 
Why did the enemy oppose so strongly? Because what God gave Daniel is something that's important. It makes a difference in the world. It's something that you and I need to know and understand about the last days. It, has, it will touch everybody on the face of the earth. And God wants his people to know and understand and to be prepared and to discern what's going on. So it was a big deal. It wasn't just a small deal. It was a big deal. Daniel didn't know what it meant. He didn't know how important it was. But he knew I must pray because I don't have the answer. Now what's the takeaway? There are many, but what's a takeaway for you and for me? What we see in the Old Testament is this. Daniel prayed, but there, were, there was a hindrance. And brothers and sisters, there are times when you and I pray. Do you feel anything? No. You and I pray. Is there an answer? No. You and I pray and we get discouraged because it seems like my prayers go this high and they come back down. What happens so often, what happens so often when we are in that type of prayer situation? Honestly, we give up. Yes? yes? We don't get an answer. We stop praying. We don't get an answer and we think, and we make it easy, sorry, but we make it easy and we say, I guess it's just not the will of God. <laughs> do we do? Now, some, sometimes, sometimes, it's not God's will. But you know what I think? I think that God is big enough to tell us and to show us this is not my will in this situation. God can do that. I think we make it too easy on ourselves in prayer when we pray and we just say one or two times or just a short time we say, well, it didn't happen, so I guess, and we go on to something else. And what, as I look at this, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you this morning and urge you this morning, if the enemy would hinder Daniel in this situation, do you think he does not do the same for us when you and I are praying? And we give up and we stop praying and we lose what we could have gained in prayer just by giving up so easily and so quickly. I believe so. I believe so. Then we look to the New Testament. What's the New Testament example? The New Testament example, I think, is the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane that night. When, and this is the practical. Now, Paul gives teaching later, and Jesus teaches as well. He says, pray, Luke 18, pray and don't give up. Persevere in prayer. Ask, seek, knock, Matthew 6. All of that. But this is not the teaching. This is practical example. Remember what Jesus said? It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You can read all those yourself. He tells his disciples, they go out to the garden. He says, pray. Pray. I'm going to go over here. Come on, Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John were supposed to be the inner circle, the prayer warriors, right? So he tells them all, you all pray. Peter, James, and John, he brings them a little bit further. He says, watch, watch. And when he says watch, he did not mean <laughs> watch. When he said watch, what he meant was be alert and pray. That's what he meant. And then he calls Peter, James, and John. You read those. Oh, what a story of failure. He says to Peter, James, and John, and all of them, he says, watch and pray so that you don't, what? Fall into temptation. What do they do? They sleep. They sleep. Their hearts are grieved. They've heard Jesus say, I'm going to leave you. And many times grief and strong emotion can affect our hearts and we don't want to pray. But what happens with Peter, James, and John and all of the disciples? They all fail at that moment and they all fall into temptation. Every one of them. Brothers and sisters, now I'm not preaching condemnation. I'm not. I'm trying to encourage you this morning. I'm trying to encourage you this morning in this way. Why does Jesus urge and say, watch and pray. Don't fall into temptation. Three or four times. Three or four times he tells them that. And they still don't get it. And before we judge the disciples, we're the same way. We're the same way. Why did Jesus say that? Because he was God and he knew what was coming. Brothers and sisters, there are times in prayer when God prompts you to pray. He pulls your heart to pray. He says, pray, pray. Or there's inside your heart, you know, I should be praying, I should be praying. But oh, we're busy. Oh, we're tired. Oh, I'll pray later. And we let it go and it loses the urgency in our hearts. And because of that, we miss out on what God has for us. We miss out on gaining a victory in that area and the enemy wins in that area and we don't receive what God wants us to have 
Why did Jesus say, watch and pray so that you don't fail and fall? He knew what was coming. Brothers and sisters, we now have with us constantly, not by our side physically, Jesus who told his disciples, watch and pray so that you don't fail and so that you don't fall into temptation. But we have God, the Holy Spirit, who is with us morning, noon, and night all the time, in good times and in bad times. And there are times when he calls us to pray. He prompts us to pray. He says, pray, pray, pray. Don't ignore the Spirit when he says pray. And don't wait for the Spirit to say pray, pray. We pray. Why does the Holy Spirit prompt us at times to pray? Because he's God. He knows what's coming. He knows what's coming. He knows what you're going to face tomorrow. And He doesn't want you to fail. He doesn't want you to fall. He knows that some of you, you are going to meet people who are making decisions for eternity this week. They're going to make a decision for God or against God. They're going to be people that will go into eternity in this next month. And you're going to come across their path. And so the Holy Spirit says, pray. Because you can make a difference in that life, in, in, in those people's lives, or in your own life. And yet we're so lackadaisical and we're so, we're so, we give up so easily in prayer and we fail so easily in prayer and we don't grab and, and take the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And He's prompting us because He knows what's coming, because He loves us. And I'll tell you something else. Although He does not know everything, because He is not omniscient and He's not everywhere, the enemy knows a lot of it too. He really does. He knows a lot of what's coming. He knows the stakes many times. He knows what's weighing in the balance and I believe that is also why the enemy works so hard to hinder you, to hinder you in prayer, to hinder you in prayer. But we close with this, and I'm skipping. We're going to go to slide seven because I did that in the first service. We're going to do it in this service. But you are not alone. You are not alone now. We close with this in about three, we, about three minutes this morning. And I want us to grab onto this. We'll come back to some other teaching next week. But here's the thing. Are you a prayer warrior? You say, no, I'm a prayer wimp. A lot of us are that way. God wants to grow up, but I want you to see something else. Prayer is often hard work. It is. It's not easy. It's a realm we don't understand always. We don't have a lot of wisdom at times. We're not particularly strong. But guess what? We're not alone. And we have a big enemy. But we have a bigger help. And I want us to close with this. As we look in Romans 8, 26 and 27, there's a whole context here that we don't have time to get into this morning. But I want us to, what I want us to see is this. So that as we go out from this place this morning, we will know whose side we are on, and who is on our side in prayer. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. And you keep on reading, brothers here and sisters, here is the wonderful certainty and promise and answer of God for you and for me in prayer. We're weak, and we're weak in prayer. And God knows it. And so what happens? God the Holy Spirit comes. God the Holy Spirit is with us in prayer. He helps us in our weakness. Jesus, the night he was betrayed, John 14, 15, and 16, he talks about the Holy Spirit and what is the name, the primary name he, and the meaning that he gives to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth, but the name before that. The comforter, which means helper, strengthener. And what does it say? The Holy Spirit does what? Helps us in our weakness. For example, in prayer. And that's the primary example He uses. So as you and I go to prayer, we don't always want to. We don't always know how to. Our minds are distracted. We feel this and that. But we are not alone. We're not alone. How many of you feel weak in prayer a lot of times? Okay, Keith, I'm going to use, use the example then. Come on up, my brother. Here we go. You, you, that's what happens when you... When you. Okay, so here's Brother Keith, and he has just said he's weak in prayer. So let's, 
let's say that this is this is something you're praying for, okay? So keep grab onto it, and you're praying. It, it's kind of like you're gonna you're praying, okay? That's the, the that's the physical example. So Keith is in prayer. He looks like he's leaning on it. Kind of get back this way, oh, like you're, well, but don't pull it over. <laughs> but don't pull it over. Okay. Like so like that. So Keith is in prayer, but he's not very strong, okay? So he's praying, but he's got the enemy opposing him. There's no way Keith can, can fight the enemy. The enemy's bigger than you. He's bigger than me, too. He's bigger than all of us. So he's opposing in prayer. So he is, Keith is pulling. He's pulling in prayer. Oh, God, the answer. He's trying to pray, but he's very, very weak. What happens? This is what, here's the, here's the physical picture for you. The Holy Spirit helps in our weakness. And what this word means, what this expression means, literally, is this. What it means is, this word help in this area, it means to take hold of with someone. So the Holy Spirit doesn't come and, I take hold of you. The, the literal meaning is, the Holy Spirit takes hold of with. So Keith is pulling in prayer. He's grabbed hold of something. And the Holy Spirit is take hold, taking hold of it with him. That's what it means, literally. Now that should help you and that should help me. What happens? Keith's pulling in prayer. Keith's praying. But he's limited in strength. He doesn't know how to pray. And, and he's feeling discouraged. But here's what happens. Let me put it in just the easy, easy terms. The Holy Spirit of God who helps us in our weakness and who is with us comes. He's praying. Here's the child of God praying who's weak, who is not strong. But because he's praying, here is the place and the person I partner with in this situation. It's not, okay, Keith, you're on your own. I'll try to give you a little bit of strength. It's not that. It is not, Keith, out of the way, I'm going to do it because I'm God. It's not that either. It is a partnership in prayer. So it is Keith, it's you, it's me, grabbing in prayer, and it's the Holy Spirit who grabs hold together with... And, with... <laughs> we didn't practice before. <laughs> You can tell this is real. But he grabs, the Holy Spirit grabs hold of with. Thank you. So what that means is this, this week. <laughs> what it means is this. Does that help you to understand? Yes. What it means is this. This week, if you're facing a situation, no matter how weak you are, if you feel like I'm weak, I just can't, I just don't, and you just don't pray or you give up praying, then you have lost the opportunity and you have lost the, the time and the place where the, where, where the Holy Spirit says, I partner with you in prayer. I grab hold of that with you. And He is strong because He's God. He's God. And so when you and I pray, we say, Holy Spirit, help me. We pray, God the Holy Spirit is with us to partner with us in prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see that and understand that, that encourages me. Amen. That encourages me to know I'm not on my own. And that encourages me when I feel it extra hard to pray. Do you know what I've started telling myself? That God, you have something good in this situation. God, you want to do something. So you know what I've decided? Enemy, you are not going to win the victory. You're not going to win this battle. Holy Spirit, you help me. We're, we're praying. We're praying. I don't always feel it. I may not always see it, but I go on the Word of God which says He is with me in prayer and He partners with me in prayer and He will bring the answer. And so we determine we're not going to give up. We're not going to let go. The Holy Spirit is waiting for opportunities to partner with us in prayer and pray the perfect prayer and accomplish God's own will. And you know what comes after that? And we know that all things work together for good. And, on, and, and so on, as the Holy Spirit works. I challenge you and encourage you this week. We'll come back to this. Read Ephesians 4. Read Ephesians 6, the armor of God, and then pray. Read these things. But this week, more than that, as you pray, as the Holy Spirit prompts you, it may be a small prayer. It may be a short one. It may be a long one. Whatever. Partner with Him. Let Him partner with you. Give Him place. 
to pray in your life and he will help you in prayer it's his specialty it's his expertise it's his realm and he'll be with you and he'll pray with you he'll partner with you to bring forth God's will in your life and in your situations Lord we come to you right now thank you so much Holy Spirit for partnering with us it's hard for us to stand I understand Lord we don't really know why we're pretty wimpy and weak partners but oh Lord help us help us and you've said that you will not to give up help us not to be disciples but help us to be Daniels help us not to be those disciples in Gethsemane but Daniel who persevered in prayer that you might win and that we might win in you that we might do what you've called us to do be what you've called us to be grow as you've called us to grow and make a difference in this world in our lives and in the lives of those that you bring across our path that we're part of at work each day oh God be victorious in our lives and may the enemy have no place to win a victory in our lives in our hearts in our prayers in Jesus name we pray Amen.